Good morning. It's Bear with BearNintendent.com. So today we're going to talk about food shortage. But first, I got to feed some of my food. Okay, so national meat production is down significantly. As of the time of this video being recorded, two out of six of the major meat butchering or meat processing facilities in the United States are not working. And the other four out of six are working at a greatly diminished capacity because so many of their workers are testing positive for coronavirus. If you've been keeping up with the Bear Daily Briefs, you're aware of this. Uh, if you haven't been, I would encourage you to keep up with the Bear Daily Briefs because I talk about this stuff every day. Uh, one of the things I would greatly encourage you all to do for a myriad reasons is get away from the system. Dog, what are you doing? Hi. That's meat food, not dog food. Sorry, Dad. Um, get out of the system, man. Do you want a bunch of coronavirus infected people handling your food? I don't. We handle our own food to the best of our ability. Now, are we all the way there? No, we're not all the way there. But uh, we're a lot closer than we've ever been, and we're a lot closer than a lot of people. So, meat processing is down. Farmers, ranchers, because of that, are killing their livestock inventory hogs cattle chickens cattle hasn't been terribly affected yet but it could be so i've been encouraging y'all to contact your local farmers and ranchers and buy directly from them because uh they need the revenue you need the meat why not and uh, it's a good experience to learn how to butcher your own animals as well. So, in addition to the system not being in an ideal position logistically to process meat, as I said, people are killing off their meat, which when you start killing off your meat, it's harder for your meat to produce more meat. You'll notice the varied sizes of animals over here. By the way, this might look like a struggle to you. It's so inhumane. No, they do this voluntarily. They're morons. Um, graceful and majestic morons, but morons nonetheless. They enjoy battling over food, at least to the best of my knowledge. I mean, they're... You ever seen mountain goats, like, butting their heads into each other? These have some of that bloodline. They're into that. So, don't feel bad for them. They live a very pampered lifestyle until they end up in my freezer or my colon. So, when you kill off all your meat, you have less meat to produce more meat. That's going to be a problem as well. So for example, the, the futures market, right? Future of what? So not only are we taking animals out of the supply chain now, we're taking our ability to produce animals out of the supply chain for later. That's a problem. So, and then we get into, um, you know, row crops and um, farming. People are plowing under their crops because they can't find people to harvest their crops. Um, whether that's a migrant worker issue or a localized labor issue or a coronavirus quarantine issue, that just the manpower and bandwidth isn't what it needs to be in order to in order for the system to process all of these fields that they have to process. Now I'm keenly aware of the fact that the system is made up of individuals and so on the one hand, I definitely believe that we should be supporting our small scale farmers, okay? Small scale agriculture or whatever, individual farmers is really important. You know, and small scale could be a quarter acre aggressively farmed or it could be 10,000 acres planted in a row, row of corn. Either way, you gotta sell 
that product, right? Either way, you gotta earn a living from that. Cool, those people should be supported. Where I see the hiccup is when all of those people feed into the same funnel of tightly controlled supply chain logistics from a handful of producers and providers in the United States and around the world. That's where things get screwy because there's not enough redundancy in the systems to allow for a hiccup like worldwide quarantine as we're seeing now. So we should absolutely be in contact with these growers, these producers as individuals, as communities to support them and to, to buy their product. We should also be growing our own food. We have, as of the time of this recording, 10,000 square foot of corn, 5,000 square foot of pinto beans, 5,000 square foot of oats, 1,000 square foot of potatoes, and 1,000 square foot of garden over there, 1,000 square foot of garden up there, 1,500 square foot of garden over there, and 1,500 square foot of garden over there, so that makes 5,000 square foot of garden. So 5,000 square foot of vegetable garden. Oh, and then we got some raised beds here in the front yard. Maybe, oh, and the asparagus beds, maybe another, maybe 5,500 total square foot of garden. And then 21,000 square foot of row crop right now. So this is about a half an acre. We probably could have planted more than that. In fact, as a community here, we have plenty of room to plant more. What I'm not sure we have plenty of uh, ability to do is weed more than that, maintain more than that, harvest and store more than that. We're gonna find out. But I believe, and I have believed for a good long while, that it's vitally important that we grow our own food. And I think this experience that we're all going through right now uh, illustrates that. I have been saying for a long time, the system is fragile. The system will break. Well, by the hand of the Most High, it's not broken yet, but it's definitely not running at full capacity. Preach it, Cedric. So... Now the battle of the roosters starts. So you definitely need to be growing your own food. You know, you don't need to do anything, but I would highly encourage you to grow your own food. Then think about how you're going to store your own food. Corn is pretty convenient. You can let it dry on the cob and then shell those kernels off the cob and you got dried corn. Put it in buckets with mylar and O2 absorbers, awesome. Grind it up and turn it into uh, cornmeal. Feed it to your critters, whatever. Um, by the way, these guys do eat grass. This particular uh, paddock that they're in right now is all eaten down, but the one next to it has got some grass in it. So we'll let them over there to frolic uh, when the sun's fully up, just because I feel like it. Um, but we also feed these guys one-third sweet feed, one-third um, all-stock pellets, and one-third scratch grains, chicken scratch grains, which is, you know, sorghum, oats, uh, corn, a couple other things. And the quality of meat and the fatting on these guys is unparalleled. And so they are grain-fed, but they're not obesely grain fed although a couple of them definitely need to pt some more a couple of them definitely need a morning run but uh that's good when they're hanging in my barn and on their way to my freezer i will like that but we found for these sheep and these are katahdins we found that to be a good blend an affordable blend of feed when supplemented with grass or hay and it produces really good quality meat. The flavor of this meat is unparalleled. So, little anecdote there. And so I realized that not everybody lives out here in the middle of nowhere like I do. And that's cool because I didn't always live out here in the middle of nowhere like I do right now. We did a lot on a suburban third of an acre 
And for those of y'all who know me, you know this part of the story, but we had 11 raised beds. We had row crops. We had meat birds and a little meat chicken tractor. Uh, we had laying hens. We had meat rabbits. We had ducks at one time. We had mature nut trees. We had uh, berry bushes and fruit trees and comp a robust compost pile. I'm talking 10 yards of compost in our suburban third of an acre backyard. I had 14 foot tall sunflowers growing on my fence line. That accounted for 40%, 40% actual of all the food that we ate came out of our backyard in suburbia, putting in about a half an hour a day and then about an hour or two, one day per week, usually on Sundays. And so it can be done. You just got to do it. You just got to start doing it. And I think that probably the trifecta for backyard suburban gardening noobs, and I say that with all love because I, won, I was one, and I still know one-tenth of one percent of what there is to know about growing food and raising livestock. But the trifecta is laying hens, in a run, which allows you to produce compost, which allows you to top dress your raised beds. So laying hens, compost, raised beds. Those three things uh, we had, we planted directly in compost in North Texas, which is where we lived in Suburbalon, because the soil was so bad, you know, we were in a suburban development the developers come in they push off off the to all the topsoil they sell that to a soil company then everything that's left underneath that is dead dry red clay soil they sprinkle that much topsoil back on top of it seed it with grass build a house on top of it and then when you dig into the ground to grow vegetables there's no nutrients in there the soil's dead and so raised beds are cool for that uh, they allow you to control your soil conditions um, on a micro scale much more easily than tilling in and fertilizing and yada, 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 yada. So, but then we planted in raised beds straight into compost that we produced ourselves. And I got just stupid for carbon. I would, I would requisition the neighborhood uh, leaf litter bags in the fall to compost. <clears throat> Had a buddy who had horse stables and uh, we'd go get sawdust with horse manure in it. I would bring planer chips from the wood shop back home and compost those. Obviously all of our scraps, then same thing with the chickens, right? The, all the chicken litter. And anyway, it, the point here is it can be done. And I've got myriad videos both on YouTube and Patreon. I mean, by the way, use the YouTube search bar uh, rather than emailing me and saying, hey, Bear, what do you think about gardening? Bear Independent Garden in the YouTube search bar. Because uh, we've got over 1,600 videos between YouTube and Patreon. So start with that. If you can't find it, then email me. Um, but it's becoming more important, I believe, for us to grow food. And I've rambled on because it's early. And this is my first cup of coffee. But uh, I just wanted to continue to share that conviction with you all and give you a couple of pointers on how we've done it. You can grow food. Preach it, Cedric. You should grow food. It's incredibly rewarding. It's very, very, very good for you. It's really good for your kids. And um, it allows you to be independent of the system or more independent of the system. That's why this channel is called Bear Independent. We want to be so wildly independent of the system that when it collapses, somebody has to come tell us. That's how I want to find out the world had ended. Amen. And with that... I'll let y'all go enjoy your morning.
Have a blessed day, YouTube. Shalom.